thank you very much for your attention. With that, I'm going to introduce Mark Papermaster, our CTO. Mark. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Look, I have fun talking about technology, and there's never been a more proud day than today to talk about what we've been at. What have we, what have we been working on the last several years, uh, which we think will be quite impactful on the industry? And you know, and I'll, I'll connect it uh, to what Lisa talked about, our focus, gaming, immersive platforms, data center. And you know, really, when you look at these trends, you, know, you can say, well, there's something just very simple in terms of what is a driving force in the need for technology. First is in front of the screen. It's the perception we have. It's how we're interacting with computing uh, so that it can be useful. And of course, it's what's behind the screen, the computing. When you look at what's driving this change of need and requirements of, of visualization, it's pretty clear. You see it around you because it is the billions of connected devices. What is that doing? It's creating a massive amount of information. It's the sensors which are embedded in every device you deal with. It's the cameras you see everywhere and the flood of video information transport. It's the analytics that businesses in almost every vertical are creating on a massive amount of data that, that you need to then analyze and make useful. So it's fundamentally changing the needs and the requirements to high resolution displays and multiple displays and whole new categories of how you deal with information for, you know, from, uh, from both entertainment to really using that uh, information in uh, virtual reality and augmented reality where you can actually manipulate that data. So the needs of visualization are absolutely in an inflection point. And of course, how do you analyze that data? That flood of data that you have needs that heavy lifting. And it's seamless between what you're using in your device, that's where you, you're actually, uh, you know, you need to do some computation device, but it, it can accomplish that heavy lifting without an assist from the cloud. So those are the markets we're focused on, and that is where we've been doubling down in terms of the building blocks at AMD. You know, no surprise, it starts with the engines. So you look at the CPUs, uh, we have redoubled our focus and new design work on CPUs both ARM and x86. We've redoubled our focus on graphics. So we've always had a leadership. It's always a leapfrog race of, a, of a leadership in, in graphics. We've maintained that pace, but we're uniquely positioned to have a leadership CPU capability, graphics capability, and the ability to put them together in a very seamless way. It's not just the engines. Right? And that's really a, a significant change in culture in AMD as well, because it is about delivering solutions at the end of the day. And so we've been investing in the software and the accelerators uh, to actually unlock the value. Right? It's, it's not about just putting out uh, great engines and saying, here, industry, you know, have at it. We've got to enable that. And so we've made significant advances, APIs that have driven a tremendous improvement in graphics performance. We have hardware codecs to allow seamless 4K uh, video streaming. Uh, we have a software enablement for emerging workloads uh, to, that really can use both the CPU, G, GPU to stand alone or, in fact, uh, together on an APU. And one thing that should be very clear to all of us uh, when you look at some of the data breaches, uh, security breaches that uh, have occurred in, in just the last uh, year and a half is the fundamental need for security. And that's a core competence. Uh, you can look at the work we did with uh, uh, game consoles uh, and, uh, and what we've done across our roadmap, it's a core competence we have, and security has to be a part of every product which we deliver. So with that, uh, what I'd like to do is dive down a little bit. So I'm going to walk through each of these and tell you what we've been up to, and I'm going to start with the cores. You know, uh, you think about it, Lisa said it, um, it's hard uh, to, and it's unfortunate, it's, an, it's the nature of our technology business. It's not software, you don't rewrite uh, a line of code, it's not just hardware, it's software and hardware coming together. And the longest lead time is the core development. And so what we've been doing uh, the last, uh, uh, I'd say, two and a half uh, years at this point, uh, we have put together a new x86 core. This is a ground-up new microarchitecture. We're very proud of it. 
Uh, we're going to uh, share a, a little bit of the information on it on it today. And you know, what is this core? Uh, this core is about high performance. We don't we don't uh, back away at all from the energy efficiency that we've been designing into our x86 CPUs, but we've doubled down on the performance characteristics of the Zen core. It's got features for very high throughput, like simultaneous multi-threading. It's got a very efficient design. You have to feed the core. You have to be able to feed it with high bandwidth with low latency. So we have a new cache subsystem and a new memory subsystem to be able to feed this new core. And very key is FinTech technology because we've married all of the design management we've, techniques we've had with FinFET, and it gives us excellent scalability. We can take the Zen core from you know, battery-dependent uh, uh, mobile devices right to enterprise-class compute capability. This is a core design for the workloads of the future. Availability, next year. Uh, we're completing that design this year. Uh, we'll have uh, availability next year, and I'd like to I explained to you a little bit uh, about the, uh, the performance and how we built that performance. It starts with the previous family, because what have we been doing with the previous family from the bulldozer core introduction in 2012 uh, to the excavator core that we just released? It's coming up uh, 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 shortly in our sixth generation APU. That's the excavator core. We've been doing incremental instruction per clock, incremental microarchitecture changes, and in driving the energy efficiency in a big way of this previous generation core. It, again, culminates in that excavator core release this summer. It has a 40% improvement in energy per efficiency, and we packed the density by almost a, a third of previous generation. So tremendous advancements as we've ratcheted the previous generation. But that wasn't going to get us back to where we needed to be in high performance cores. And what we did with the investment is there's not any one thing you can do. Uh, Jim Keller came on board, heads up our, our course team, and he rallied and brought the team together and focused on not one silver bullet, but a number of elements to drive the microarchitecture improvement and deliver what I've not seen in the industry before, a 40% improvement in instruction per clock. It's, it's quite remarkable, and again, it's a result of many, many elements done quite well to deliver that type of microarchitectural improvement. And we're not stopping there. Uh, you know, one of the key things uh, that we have to do at AMD is have sustained innovation. We're not going to do a flash in the pan with the new core that we come out with next door. Next year, we want regular updates. We want to stay on the pace. And so we have leapfrogging design teams. Our next generation uh, core is already well underway. And what you'll see is a family of cores over time. So this is a huge commitment from AMD and a commitment to have sustainable innovation. So we're very, very excited about our core work. Uh, and you'll hear more of the, of the presentation as to how that rolls out in our product roadmap and the impact it has on the markets that we can serve. OK, I want to talk about ARM, give you an update. We announced uh, the the uh, K-12 uh, core at a session we had last year. And we said we had a V8, ARM V8 architectural license. And we've made great progress. The team has uh, leveraged that license. We brought the uh, core up. We have it up and running in simulation. And what we've done to give you the update is uh, we've chosen to really leverage the synergy with our X86 core work. It's all one core team. We don't run it as two separate efforts. And so what we're doing is fully leveraging that synergy uh, we have uh, put the availability in 2017. We've aligned it with our customer needs, market needs, uh, and the ARM ecosystem for enterprise applications coming together. So that's the update on, uh, on K-12, uh, and it's uh, on track for 2017 sampling. All right. The other side of the core equation is, of course, uh, the graphics. And, you know, this is where uh, AMD has... Uh, such a such a long history of graphics innovation, and you know I'll I'll, I'll go back uh, to uh, not by any means the beginning of that long history in the ATI heritage, but I'm going to go back to 2012, where we rolled out Graphics Core Next, new architecture for our Radeon graphics, and when we did this, it was quite revolutionary because it 
it didn't just bring a new high performance bar, which it did with the R9 290, but it did more than that. With Graphics Core Next, it provided an architecture to make it easier to write optimizing compilers, to make it easier for programmers to unlock the value of our graphics, both for visualization and compute. Really a groundbreaking architecture, and you can see the adoptions. So it's, of course, our discrete graphics business, but much more than that. It's in, all, it's in the game consoles. Uh, you see it in uh, the Mac Pro. You see it in the iMac with a 5K retina display. You see it in leading workstation designs, server installations. It's scalable from mobile applications to high-performance uh, computing applications, and it's got an install base of over 100 million for developers to leverage. This has been a very, very successful architecture, and we've built on it. We built on it in the last uh, two years by really accelerating the performance with APIs. Mantle shook the industry as we showed that you could eliminate intervening layers of software and rapidly increase the draw calls, the, the visualization capability of our graphics core. We've added uh, advanced memory uh, with compression techniques. We've added uh, virtualization of our graphics. We've added a set of capabilities in virtual reality that we're very excited about and we're going to talk about over the course of the day here. And we've added high bandwidth memory, which I'll uh, talk about in a little bit more detail in just a second. But Raja Kaduri and his team on graphics are not stopping. Like the CPU cores, we're working always on the next generations. And what you'll see is we're taking our graphics also into FinFET technology. We're going to push our graphics to have all that same leverage, and we're tweaking the GCN to make it even more energy efficient. In fact, uh, as we release our third generation GCN, it will have a 2x energy efficiency improvement, and we're going to drive yet further optimizations on workloads that we are already seeing excel on GCN, uh, such as machine learning and a number of uh, artificial intelligence applications. So graphics technology, we've been delivering. We're very excited. It's on, there's more innovation to come. And I, again, I want to dive down into high bandwidth memory for just a moment. This is quite a feat. We've actually been working on high bandwidth memory for almost seven years. Why? It involves, frankly, an ecosystem. It's what are we doing at AMD with our technology, what are the memory vendors providing, and the packaging ecosystem to put it together. The whole supply chain has to come together to deliver HBM, and when you do, it provides dramatic results. Because what HBM does is it stacks the high bandwidth memory DRAM using Guru Silicon Vias to allow a 3D stacking of that DRAM uh, technology. We then connect it through a silicon interposer to our discrete graphics chip. So it's not going off chip in those connections from the memory to the graphics. Well, what does that do? What that means when you're not driving off chip is you are more compact, and you require far less power. And that's why we're able, with HBM technology, to deliver significant improvement. We'll see over 3x performance for watt improvement versus graphics DDR5 memory, which were as deployed in RMD products and across the industry. It's a 50% power savings. This is quite impactful, and we're excited as we roll it out this year in our discrete graphics roadmap. So more on that to come as we talk about our product shortly. All right, let's keep going. Let's talk about putting this together, putting the solutions together. Uh, the, the engines are critically important. They're the foundation that we build everything on with our CPU and graphics. But again, we've doubled down our focus on the enablement. And what I want to do is uh, start with, really, a discussion on energy efficiency. So in every segment that we play, energy efficiency matters. It's the battery life in mobile. It's the total cost of ownership in the data center. You can't compete if you don't have the technology to bring energy efficiency in every market that you play. And we've made a lot of progress. You know, we've, we have brought a 10x improvement over the last six years. If you look up to 2014, it's 10x improvement in energy efficiency 
efficiency in our mobile designs. But that's not where we're going. We're committing to a 25x improvement in energy efficiency between now and 2020. And we're well on the way with Carrizo, our sixth generation APU. Uh, it's driven by the enhancements in the excavator core and much more than that because we drove design elements. Of course, it's harbor design elements with, uh, with clock gating and power islands and all of the techniques of the, of the uh, IP elements, but it's much more than that. It's across the software stack. It's through managing power on the display. It's all the elements you need to bring together. Uh, excellent step with Creso, much more to come. So energy efficiency has and remains vital in front, in, uh, front and center in our uh, R&D development efforts at AMD. Next, I want to talk about security. I mentioned it earlier. It, it's simply fundamental because what you're seeing is uh, software alone is insufficient. Uh, you can have various, uh, various techniques and software layers, but what you have to have is a combination of the software working seamlessly with the hardware. And we have, with the AMD Secure Processor, established across all of our designs going forward, our, our, new, uh, our new designs that, that we're working on, we're embedding in each of them this AMD Secure Processor, which establishes a, a root of trust upon boot. So every access that you do from boot on is authenticated. It leverages uh, an, uh, an A5 embedded controller. It leverages an AMD cryptographic engine. And from a software standpoint, in partnership with ARM, it's leveraging Trust Zone. So it's creating a software ecosystem that's then easy to build software applications that ride on that hardware root of trust that we established from the moment you boot up an AMD processor. It's a requirement going forward. You have to provide security, and we do with the secure processor. You know, next I want to talk about our programming model. And this has really been, you know, a huge investment for us. And I'll, I'll go back to, uh, to three years ago when we rolled out the Heterogeneous System Architecture Foundation. AMD was a founding member. We invited other companies to join us, and over 40 did, because we're committed to open platforms. And what we said is we wanted to unlock the value of CPUs and GPUs working together and CPUs and accelerators working together because it takes more than just the foundry node to keep pace with a Moore's Law rate of improvement on performance. You have to provide other acceleration methods, and that's what we're doing at AMD. We uh, have delivered capability on track, so if you look at the end of last year, uh, the compiler for the uh, heterogeneous system architecture was delivered. Our OpenCL 2.0 support for our AMD products was delivered. And so excellent progress, again, on an open approach with this HSA to unlock the value. So this is, this is coherent memory access across CPU and GPU. Uh, this is, you know, context, preemptive switching, so you can immediately uh, context switch between the CPU and, CPU and GPU. And what it means is performance. And you'll hear, again, over the course of the day, how we're realizing that performance in real-world applications. And for those that are with us uh, here in New York today, we have demonstrations of that capability in our products. Machine learning. I am very, very excited about machine learning or deep neural nets. Why? It's an inherently parallel operation. And it is provide, it's actually proving to be a transformation effect on a number of industries. I've worked with some startups that were working on various uh, algorithms, various optimizations, and they were running into basically dry wells. They were running uh, out of the computing capability they needed to solve their di difficult problems. And what they've realized is, and with machine learning, it uses an algorithm. It's a gradient descent analysis. It's an optimization algorithm. It's well known in the technical community, and it's highly parallelizable. And when you take applications that uh, can leverage machine learning, we can provide a very, very rapid speed up with our AMD technology. And of course, you have to provide the software enablement. What's out there today is widely deployed Torch 7 in CAFE. But actually, most of the implementations today, most of those implementations are in proprietary code. And that's not what we're about. So we have mapped CAFE and Torch 7 to an open source approach, putting it out there to run on our, uh, our Radeon and our Fire Pro our graphics, 
and we'll be uh, releasing that through the open source. Uh, uh, we'll have that available in the second half of this year. And then Liquid VR and all of the work that we're doing around virtual reality. This is a new category. And when you look at what we've done is we're leveraging capabilities that we have in Graphics Core Next, and we're building upon them. So we talked, I, I talked about uh, a, asynchronous compute engine. It was actually in our first uh, generation of Graphics Core Next when we released it in 2012. We are leveraging that in a way that's turned out to be essential for virtual reality. Because if you're in a virtual environment, you can't break the presence. If you have a delay, too long a delay, if you see a break in the image, you, don't, you, you break presence. You have a very unsettling experience rather than a, a virtual immersive experience. And the asynchronous compute engines provide a capability we call time warp. So as you traverse and you move around in a virtual environment, while we're rendering the space that you're looking at, we are actually in parallel calculating the images and, and doing a shift, a matrix shift, as you shift, as you look elsewhere. It's quite impactful, and when you see this in the, de in the demonstration, you'll see it provides a very smooth uh, experience in, in uh, virtual reality workloads. And there's more. We'll talk more later about some of the additional features uh, that we have in virtual reality. So double down investment in software and our programming enablement. Okay, last piece I want to talk about in terms of our uh, platform enablement is our modularity. Uh, you, you can say, why is Mark talking about modularity? Is this, isn't this sort of just uh, blocking and tackling kind of stuff? It's actually not. Uh, it's very hard to do because it affects every piece of how you put a system on a chip together. Uh, it creates uh, its technological challenge, and frankly, it's a cultural challenge because it drives every team uh, to do uh, their work in a different way than they have for years. And frankly, modularity has transformed every industry that's adopted it. Look at the automotive industry. Look at Ford. Ford adopted modularity and fundamentally changed uh, their ability to get products uh, to market and to, and to leverage technology across their product lines. And you can look at other industries and see that same impact of modularity. We brought modularity to high performance system on a chip, and it is transformative. Because what it, we've done is actually put a protocol, a standard way of interconnect around each of our building blocks, each of our IPs. We've leveraged uh, our experience in coherent hypertransport. We built upon it. So we had a fabric, an interconnect that was, uh, was proven, and we built upon it to create a high performance, scalable interconnect for our IP that we put it together, third party IP as well, and then we've actually made it extensible off chip. So this is a very, very capable AMD network on chip. And, and it's a, what it really allows us to do is have tremendous flexibility in how we put our solutions together. It can be ARM. It can be x86. It's ISA agnostic in terms of how you put this together. Again, third-party IP. So very, very flexible, and we've implemented modularity into our entire methodology, our power management, our test, our, all of the elements that have typically been in centralized units, we've decentralized. So again, allow us to be much more agile in putting these solutions together. It's a quicker time to market and it's actually a higher quality at the end of the day as you can leverage more reuse across your portfolio. And that's what I want to talk to you about because this is how now we'll be putting our solutions together is in this modular approach. So when you have a chip that we can talk about, you know, Forrester talked about his business in the data center. Obviously, that's a very uh, high demand on CPU technology. And so you configure with a very high, PC, high CPU content on that system on a chip. Likewise, for client and embedded SOCs, many applications that leverage heterogeneity. And so they're going to have CPU cores and GPU cores uh, in, in combination. And then the discrete graphics, where you load up as many GCN cores as you fit given the potential, uh, the, the target market that you're after. So you need to be able to scale across the graphics stack, and it takes uh, several uh, implementations and we'll be very rap we can very rapidly attune our implementations to that market. But what's common across all of these, of course, is the software. It's all of our drivers. It's all of the 
uh, a capability that we have to, that marries with each of the hardware blocks, and it's our accelerator capability and its security. So those are constant across those capabilities while we can change the other, the other elements. And then what's particularly exciting uh, is what this modularity means for our semi-custom business. Uh, because as I said, we designed our AMD network on chip to be able to fold in not only third-party IP, but a customer's IP. And so it allows us to be more agile as well in our semi-custom business and lower our time to market with our customers in this business. Modularity can be transformative, and that's what we're doing uh, with this approach at AMD. Okay, we're, we're out of time. I want to wrap up. Look, I, I, you know, I don't know how to say this, then, you know, we were really clear on our goal with the Zen design, and it's getting back, getting right back into the, that competitive, high-performance CPU. And, you know, you look at the market out there, uh, you know, it's a wide open space, as you heard from Lisa, in terms of bringing competition back to high performance, x86. Graphics, we're going to continue the pedal to the metal. It, it's, it's always been a fight. They'll continue a fight. We like our path. We've invested. We will deliver. And, of course, that modularity that I just talked about, the flexibility uh, that it brings and the solutions uh, that we put around it. So, in summary, you know, what I'm going to tell you is, uh, you know, I'm an industry veteran, and so I've had the opportunity uh, to work uh, and, and, and the, uh, the pleasure of being able to work on a number of impactful products to the market. Uh, so it's been a great number of years I've been in the industry, but I've never been more proud of the innovation and the tenacity of the team, of any team, compared to the team I have here that we're working with in AMD. We have been focusing on reloading our war chest of technology, and we're ready for the fight. So thank you very much. And with that, Lisa, I'm going to turn it back to you.